Freedom and plenty, they go hand in hand. In America, our plenty gives us the strength to keep our freedom. It is the material evidence of our success as a democracy. We have. We enjoy more of the material comforts of life than any other people. Telephones, for instance. We have one phone for every seven persons. England has one for sixteen. Russia has only one for every 189 persons. Automobiles, one for every four persons here, one for 22 in England, one for 29 in Sweden, and in Russia, one for every 252 persons. America produces 34% of the world's electric power, and 80% of our homes are wired for electricity. America has only 7% of the world's population, and yet we produce about 50% of the world's manufactured goods. 7% of the world's population makes half of its products. Now, how did this come about? Well, America's production might is well known. Our engineering and production wizards deserve great credit. But before factories can grow, before mass production is possible, a demand must be created for the products. People must want things. Well, here's how it happened in America. At the turn of the century, we were still relatively undeveloped in manufacturing and distribution when compared with European countries. Our facilities were crude. At about that time, a group of pioneer salesmen went up and down the land, missionaries of business. These pioneers had to work against many obstacles. The very job of reaching the retailers who could sell their merchandise was in itself an exhausting task in those days. Objections and prejudices met them on every hand. But these men persisted, courageously and enthusiastically, so that goods began to move from factory to store, in a constantly increasing stream. But this raised another problem. The problem of moving these goods from retailer to consumer. Now this was a job for another kind of salesman, the retail salesman. His was a tough job too, but those salesmen were tough. Courageously they kept on working to overcome objections against their products and improvements. For example, my clerks will leave me. It's a reflection on their honesty. It'll save your bookkeepers a lot of time. It's too expensive. A broom costs only 50 cents. Yes, but see how it makes your work easier. I pay for it, but never own it. Not interested. But think of the people you can ring up. Twenty-four people now have telephones in this city. You got a die to win? I don't want any. It's a sure way to save money and still get protection. It's noisy, it smells, it's just a fad. I'll keep my horse. Come and take a ride anyhow. In spite of all these prejudices, those pioneer salesmen kept their enthusiasm, their courage. And slowly but surely, they won consumer acceptance for the products they sold. People began to buy, and so factories got more orders. Then small factories grew into big ones. New companies sprang up to meet the demand for goods. This was proof of the importance 
and the effectiveness of the new American salesmanship. Some of the pioneer salesmen became executives, trained new men who went out to create additional consumer acceptance, and still more factories were built. Whole communities developed around the industries. This process continued over several decades, building America into the greatest, richest nation of all time. Salesmen created the demands which led to the growth of American industry during the first half of the 20th century. It was salesmen who helped make possible America's engineering and production development. For today, we know how to produce. But there are still millions of people who need millions of the things salesmen have to sell. And so, authorities say that there's an even bigger job for the second half of the century. The job of better distribution of goods, to bring more and better things to more people, to help all citizens attain higher standards of living, constantly improving our national welfare. Today, salesmen have a greater opportunity than ever before to create the demand which will use the goods America's tremendously expanded facilities are capable of producing. Yes, the salesman is today's man of destiny. He is vital to our economy. As a result, he can look forward to the future with confidence. He knows that he will be recognized when he does a good job. As a salesman grows older in experience, he can become more valuable, and thus his job is more secure. A good salesman can always make money, even in times when general business is slow. Perhaps the biggest advantage enjoyed by the salesman is the experience he gains in human relationships, as well as experience in business methods, organizing, and planning. Because of this experience, more executives come from the ranks of salesmen than from any other group. For instance, 38% of the presidents of American corporations are former salesmen. The next largest group represents only 17%. Among today's salesmen are many of tomorrow's executives. And you, who are engaged in selling, are in this group, modern counterparts of the old pioneer. But yours is a greater opportunity. While the old-timers were building America, they were building a method of distribution, a method new to the world. They learned some fundamentals unknown or unpracticed in other countries. They developed our American way of creating a demand for goods, a way of moving merchandise through salesmanship. All that they learned by long, hard hours of work against obstacles, all that they learned is yours. The foundation has been laid. To build on that foundation means to develop in yourself those things which have been proved by experience. Qualities like optimism and courage the techniques of handling people, managing your time, knowing your goal and keeping your sights set on leadership. And you who build on this foundation, you who apply those fundamentals, you have an opportunity unparalleled in history. The opportunity to build America to new heights of prosperity and to build for yourselves whatever success you want in this life.